Well, a very good evening to you and welcome to Cornerstone Church Abergavenny's evening service. It's great to have you with us this evening on our um, online service and this evening um, we'll be praying together, singing together and hearing from God's word and we pray that although we are once again as we've been for almost a year now um, on and off uh, not together physically we pray that God will bless us bless our time together and be working in our hearts by his spirit to stir us up in love for one another and for Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. Well firstly let me apologise for um, what I'm affectionately calling my lockdown locks. Um, it's um, still a couple of days away from when the barbershops finally open again and I can get this trimmed and I hope that you find my flowing locks not too distracting this evening. And secondly, let me say a very happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers who are watching this. Uh, again, we pray that God will bless you and we thank you for all that you do. Um, and we pray that you will um, have had a good day today as you've been remembered and celebrated. This evening we are continuing our series through the book of Ephesians. Um, we're just still in chapter one. This is our second sermon in this series. And this evening we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter one and verses 15 to 23. Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. So grab your Bibles and turn there with me now. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. This is what it says. Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Which, his, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Wow, what powerful words they are um, that we'll be um, considering and taking to heart this evening. As we continue our worship together this evening, let's turn to God in prayer. Let's pray together now. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can um, gather together, although um, separate physically, we are one spirit, we are your body as we've just read, we are your church and we gather together around your gospel, around your love for us, around the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Father, as we seek to worship you tonight in spirit and in truth, we, play that, we pray that you would be with us, that you would draw close to us, that you would speak to us, that you would challenge us where we need to be challenged and encourage us where we need to be encouraged, comfort us where we need to be comforted, build us up where we need to be built up, be tearing down the bad things in our lives, tear down our sin and our idolatries and things that get us, get in the way of us living our Christian lives and living as faithful followers of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Father, we pray, would you be with um, all in our church who suffer and are burdened and heavy laden at the moment, 
all who mourn, all who grieve, all who are downcast. Father, this evening, would you be comforting them by your spirit? Would you draw close to them? Would they know your presence with them? Know it not just intellectually, but in experience, we pray. And Father, would we, each and every one of us, whether we're in a time of joy or whether we're in a season of sadness, would we know your presence with us? Would we know that experience, the known and felt presence of you with us um, in the everyday things of life? Would you be with us um, as we continue our worship this evening and as we go on into the week that is to come? Heavenly Father, be with us and bless us, we pray. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue our worship now and we're going to continue to pray, really, as we sing our next um, song, which is Speak, O Lord. And of course, that really is a prayer that God would speak to us as we continue round his word this evening. So let's sing together now. Speak, O Lord. Well, amen to that. Let's um, turn now to God's word together. Turn back with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. And as you turn there, let me uh, begin by asking you a question. I wonder what powers you through each day? What powers you through 
each day? What gets you up out of bed on a Monday morning when the weather outside is awful? I wonder, is it the thought of getting to the end of the day, being able to put your feet up and read a good book, or maybe getting to the end of the day and being able to watch some TV and relax, or maybe it's getting to the end of the day and having some time for your own hobbies. Maybe that's what gets you through the day at work or doing whatever it is that you've got to do. Maybe it's the thought of getting home from work and being able to spend time with your kids. Or maybe it's knowing that the kids will soon be in bed and you'll have some time to regather your thoughts and relax. Maybe you're one of those people who is blessed and loves what they do each day. And so what gets you through each day is simply doing what you love doing each day. What is the power that gets you through each day? What powers you through each day? Well, in our passage this evening, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Ephesians, the Ephesian church, and of course, writing for us today, unpacks the power that is at work in every Christian. So let's look at this passage and see what God has for us this evening and what we can learn about the power that is at work in believers. Well, at the start of our passage in verse 15, Paul says, for this reason or therefore, And what he's doing there is showing us that really he's building on what we heard last month, what he explained in verses 1 to 14 of chapter 1. He's building on that comfort, confidence and praise that we heard about, if you can remember all the way back to the last sermon. He's building on that, um, those great and powerful and lofty words that we heard last time out, those Trinitarian words, those words about the sovereignty of God, God's rule over all things, and especially our salvation in choosing us to be his children. And now, having, having said that to us and to the Ephesian church, Paul says, now that you've heard about God's plan for salvation, God's plan to choose you to be holy before him, to be his children, for this reason, he says, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So having said that to them, he says, I've not stopped giving thanks for you. I've not stopped praying for you. And that's what he um, is doing here now. He's praying for them, giving thanks for them. And that prayer for thanksgiving and thanksgiving for the Ephesians overflows into a prayer of intercession. He prays thanksgiving for them and then he goes on to pray or to tell them what else he's been praying for them. You see, in Paul's letters, it's quite common for him to start with a prayer of thanksgiving and then a prayer of intercession for the people that he's writing for. A prayer of intercession is just a prayer on behalf of them. He just tells them what he's been praying for them. And when Paul does that, what he usually does is introduces in his prayer what the letter that he is writing is going to be about. Paul's prayers introduce and highlight the main themes of the letter. It really makes sense that he prays what he's going to be telling them. He prays, I want you to understand this, and then goes on to explain what this is throughout the letter of the Ephesians. Um, for those of you who have done academic work in, um, in the past, even just at school, you probably remember that you're told that when you're writing an essay, when you introduce an essay, you're supposed to start off by telling the reader in the introduction what you're going to tell them. The introduction is telling them what you're going to tell them in the rest of the essay. And Paul, in his letters, prays what he's going to tell them. He prays that they'd understand what he's going to tell them and that they'd get it and that it would um, go to their hearts and it would transform them and it would be their own. So we're going to look at that prayer this evening that Paul prays for them and that introduces or continues to introduce the letter to the Ephesians. So what does Paul pray here? Well, firstly, it's another Trinitarian prayer. We see it there, don't we, in verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. 
Once again, he's praying that God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit would be at work within their lives. And specifically, here in verses 17 and 18, he's praying for the Spirit to give them wisdom and revelation that they may know him better. That the very eyes of their hearts may be enlightened by that Spirit. And of course, when Paul prays that they would have the spirit that would bring them knowledge and that would enlighten their hearts, he's not talking about conversion. We know already that um, in verse 15, he's thanked, he, he's thanked God in his prayers for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. These are Christians that he's writing to. We know from verse 13 and 14 um, that we heard about last time that these people have been sealed already by the promised Holy Spirit, which guarantees their inheritance um, until they take possession of it. So these are Christians that he's writing to. He's not talking about a prayer for conversion, but rather that their eyes would be enlightened, not to Christ and the gospel for the first time, but in a new and deeper way to what they've experienced already. They've already been sealed by the Spirit, but this is an additional wisdom and knowledge about God that can only come from God himself. Paul is praying that these people would have a new knowledge and experience of God that can only come from God. So Paul is praying that they would have knowledge from God and knowledge about God. And we've got to say at this point that what Paul is praying for isn't just head knowledge. He's not praying that the Ephesians' heads would grow bigger, that they would get more intellectual knowledge about Jesus, about God, about the gospel, about their faith. Of course, the Christian faith involves an intellectual element. God's created us to be thinking intellectual creatures. But what Paul is talking about here is more than that. He's not talking about them knowing more about God in information, but he's talking about a knowledge that will lead to transformation, that is the foundation for transformation. Paul is talking about an experiential knowledge. Jonathan's been guiding us through the Song of Songs and about help, and helping us to, um, to, to ensure that our Christianity is experiential, that it's relational, because of course, Christianity is a relationship with God. Adoption is relationship. The church being the bride of Christ is about relationship. So this is experiential knowledge. Um, the great preacher Jonathan Edwards used to use the example that there is the knowledge that is knowing that honey is sweet. You can have the knowledge where you say, I know that honey is sweet. But there's a different kind of knowledge, which is having tasted that honey is sweet and knowing that sensation of it on your tongue, feeling that sweetness, knowing it in that way. There's a difference between knowing intellectually that gravity works and falling down the stairs, isn't there? There's a difference there. And of course, in the Bible, if you're um, familiar with some of the older translations, you know um, that that word know can be something which has all kinds of intimacy behind it. That's where babies come from. This is a knowledge that talks about um, experience and about knowing um, knowing from experience, not knowing intellectually. This is the kind of knowledge about God and from God that Paul wants the Ephesians to be experiencing. I'm reminded of that great hymn, um, I Cannot Tell, where it says, but this I know, this I know, he heals the brokenhearted and stays our sin and calms our lurking fear and lifts the burden from the heavy laden. I can't imagine that it was an intellectual knowledge of those things that led the writer of that hymn to pen those words. This is a knowledge that knows from experience. That is what Paul is praying for. And so what does he want them to know? What does he want them to know intellectually and by experience? Well, firstly, our incredible hope, our incredible hope, verse 18 our incredible hope. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Again, this is building on what we spoke about last month, 
talking about the certainty of the hope that we have as Christians. Paul will go on to say in Ephesians 2 that our hope is so certain that we are already seated with Christ in the heavenly places, as as if we're already up there in heaven. We are up there in heaven with Christ through union with him. That's how certain our salvation is. That's how certain our hope should be. And of course, the emphasis here for Paul is that this is a certainty in the face of evidence to the opposite. This is certainty in the face of evidence to the opposite. So for example, I hope that it will be sunny tomorrow because the weather forecast has said that the weather should be okay. That's a vague hope based on vague evidence that it might come off, okay? I hope that my team will win at the rugby or the football because they're on a good run of form and they're playing against an opposition who are worse than them. Again, that's a vague hope based on vague evidence. Well, this is different. This is a, hurt, a certain hope that's, um, that exists despite apparent evidence to the contrary when we look at the world around us. This is a certain hope of victory when we look at a world that is full of sin and suffering and apparent defeat. But we can remember, can't we, that we can have certainty because Christ's great triumph was at the very moment where everything looked most lost, looked most hopeless. And so Paul says, we can have a sure and certain hope. We can know the hope to which he has called us, even when the world around us looks like that hope is a hope which is hopeless. This isn't a vague hope. This is a certain hope because of what Christ has done. And as we'll see, because of the power of Christ, which is at work within us, this is a certain hope. So when you look at the suffering that you're going through, when you look at the sin and suffering in the world around you, when you look at the niggling sins in your own heart and soul, when you feel so far from salvation, from final salvation, from heaven, from God himself, we can know, Paul says, or he prays that we will know a sure and certain hope to which we have been called. And the basis for this hope, as we'll see, is the power of Christ that is at work within us. The basis of this hope is what Christ has done for us in living a perfect life, in dying in our place, in rising again from the dead when all look to be defeated, he was actually defeating. We can have hope. And we should pray that God will make us to know in intellect and in experience that hope for ourselves. And of course, there is an element of implication here for us in our day-to-day -day lives. Not only should we have hope in the face of sin and suffering, but this should cause us to, to want to live in a manner worthy of that calling, that hope to which we have been called. We should be seeking to live out our Christian life because we've been called to a hope far beyond our wildest dreams or imagination. This is the hope we've been called to now and for eternity, that we will be in relationship with God in, um, in heaven and in the new creation for all eternity. We can be certain of that hope because Christ lived and died and rose again for us. And Paul wants us to know intellectually and in experience that hope to which we have been called, that incredible hope. That's the first thing that Paul wants the Ephesians and us today to know, that incredible hope. The second thing that he wants us to know intellectually and for ourselves is his inheritance, his glorious inheritance. Look with me down at verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. That's the second thing that he wants us to know. In chapter one, if you remember, we saw that as Christians, as believers, as people who have repented of our sins and turned to Christ, 
accepting his life, death and resurrection on our behalf, we become children of God who have an inheritance laid up for us in heaven, the guarantee of which is the Holy Spirit until we take possession of it, Paul says. We know that we have an inheritance in heaven. Maybe, maybe just maybe we're starting to get our heads around that idea that through faith in Christ, through his grace alone, we have an inheritance for us in heaven. That might blow our, mi- that might blow our minds, but we can just start to get our heads around it. Well, now listen to what Paul says here. Paul says in verse 18, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Paul is showing us that more than just us having an inheritance in heaven, actually we ourselves as Christians, as believers, as his holy people, we are his glorious inheritance. As Christians, we are God's inheritance. Can you believe that? We, the church, are Christ's inheritance, God's treasured possession, his riches. That's what it says here. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Paul wants us to know that intellectually as fact, but he also prays that we would start to know it or he prays that the Ephesians would start to know it. And this, of course, is for us today as well, that we would know that as experience, that we would understand that we are God's inheritance if we have repented of our sin and turned in faith to Christ. Can you just start to imagine the implications that that has for us? We are his inheritance, his treasured possession. We are um, his riches. Jonathan, as I mentioned, has been taking us through the Song of Songs and trying to get us to understand that we are the bride of Christ. We are his beloved. We are loved by him on that depth, that level of intimacy and experience. And for some of us, that's been hard, hasn't it? It's taken some time to start working through just what that means. And here again, Paul is showing us that he wants us to know that not only do we have an inheritance in heaven, Not only will we spend eternity in paradise with the God of all the universe, the God of all love and all good things, but more than that, we will do all of that as his treasured possession. As it says in the prophet Zephaniah, the one, um, the people who he rejoices over with singing, the people who he will quiet with his love. What implications that has for us when we doubt our self-worth, when we're loathing ourselves, when we're struggling through lives, feeling insignificant, whatever it might be, whatever struggles you're going through, whatever sin you're struggling with, if if you've truly repented of your sin, if you've truly turned to Christ in faith, then no matter what you feel like this evening, the truth is that you are his treasured possession. And the truth is that we should be praying that we would know that as an intellectual fact, and as our experience. What difference that would make to our prayer life, what difference that would make to our Bible reading when we realise that when we come to God, we're coming not as stained sinners, but as stained sinners who have been redeemed by Christ into his treasured possession, into his glorious inheritance. What confidence that can give us, what comfort, how this should shake us to our core as we actually consider the way that we live in the light of this, how unworthy we are. When we look at how often we fall short of God's standards, this should shock us, shouldn't it? We should be living, as I mentioned, lives worthy of the calling to which we've been called. And Paul tells us that calling is not only that we have an inheritance, but that we are an inheritance. We should be living lives worthy of being God's inheritance. But let's remember when we fall short, it's of grace. We are here by grace. We stand by grace. We came in by grace and we continue on in the Christian life by grace. It's not a case of in by grace, on by works. We are his glorious inheritance by grace. But let me take a moment at this point just to say, just to remind us that these glorious truths of the gospel that Paul is introducing, that Paul is praying that the Ephesians might know for themselves, that I want us to know for ourselves. 
This is only for people who have repented of their sin. This is for Christians. This is for people who have said, I know that I've rejected God. I know that I've rejected life itself because God is life. I know that I've chosen death naturally because of my sin. And it's for people who have seen that in Christ there is hope. In Christ, God came down. God gave himself for us. He lived a perfect life, which becomes our life through faith. And we'll see why in just a moment. He died a death that becomes our death. He rose again to new life, which becomes our new life. He ascended far above all, um, all things for us. That becomes our victory in him. So if you haven't repented of your sin, turn away from your sin now. Turn to Christ in faith, because this is the hope for those people who have done that for Christians, for believers. So we've seen firstly, the incredible hope to which we've been called. We've seen secondly, that we are his inheritance. And thirdly, and finally, now we see verse 19 to 23, we see that it is about his incomparably great power for us who believe. His incomparably great power for us who believe. That's the third thing that Paul wants the Ephesians and us today to know um, intellectually, but by experience as well, his incomparably great power for us who believe. And Paul goes on to say, verse 20, um, verse 19 to 20, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Paul is saying that he wants us to know the incomparably great power for us who believe. And he tells us that that power which is for us who believe, is the same power, the very same power that raised Christ from the dead, and not only from the dead, but then above all things, above everything, to to the supreme place. Paul wants us to understand that that was for us, that power was for us in rising Christ from the dead, above all things. And more than that, that power is now at work in us. That power is now at work in us. It's for us and at work in us. You see, Jesus, through his obedience, through his suffering, through his humiliation, he fulfilled the law for us. He he, he lived a perfect life that none of us could have lived in perfect relationship with God, the Father. He died in our place, taking upon himself the punishment for the sins of all who have and will believe in him. He took the punishment, the rejection of God that we all deserve. He took death itself that we all deserve. And bringing our salvation in in him. And now God has raised him far above everything. He conquered in his victorious death into the highest place of glory above all. That power which did that for us is now at work in us. And there are three ways, really, or three places that this power is at work. And the first one is in the believer. So this power is at work in the believer, for the believer. Verse 19, Paul says, this power is um, for us who believe. For us who believe. So this power, if uh, if you're a Christian, this power is at work for you and in you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. I think this has huge implications for us, doesn't it? As we consider um, daily life, the struggles of daily life, as we think about our struggles with sin, fighting sin, putting sin to death, as we're called to do as Christians, as we think about needing daily repentance, as we think about um, our sanctification, our becoming more like Christ, as we think about good deeds, as we think about assurance of faith, So often as we look at our own lives, as we look at the world around us, the world that we live in, 
this can all seem so far away from us, can't it? It can feel so alien to us, so unattainable in the mess of modern life. It, it feels a million miles away. But Paul says, however we feel, there is a power at work for us and in us if we believe in him. And Paul goes on to say that the reason that this power is at work for us and in us as believers is because we are part of the church. We are part of the church. So that's the second place that this power is at work. Or rather, it's in at work in the believer by extension of the believer being part of the church. If you look with me at verse 22, we see this. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So Paul is saying that Christ is given as head over all things. So he is raised above all things, and now he's given to the church as the supreme head of the entire universe, of the spiritual and physical realms. He's given as head over all those things to the church. He's given to the church to be head of the church, but also as head over all things, with supreme power far above all things, incomparable power, Paul says. And so because of that, he can give life to the church, all life, new life, the new life that, that, he, that he had as he was raised from the dead by that same power becomes the power at work in the church and by extension, the believer. And so when it feels like we don't have that new life, when it feels like our body of death is clinging to us and sin and all those elements of our past life, Paul wants us to be reminded and then to know for ourselves the power of that new life within us. Um, When it feels like we're not going anywhere in our Christian life, if anything, we're going backwards. Paul says that we can pray, that we can come to God and ask that he would show us that power that is at work within us, that we might know by experience this power bringing life and growth to the church and by extension to the believer. And because of this, we can know the ultimate victory over suffering and death and sin is certain. Our ultimate salvation is certain, ultimate renewal and the ultimate renewal of the entire cosmos is guaranteed because of the power that raised Christ from the dead. And not only from the dead, but far above all things. So when we look at a world of sin, we can know that Christ has conquered and we will conquer in him because that power is at work within us. When we look at a world of suffering, we can know that Christ will conquer because Christ conquered suffering for us and that power is at work within us. When we look at the world, which Paul says in Romans is groaning in pains of childbirth and that the world, this, this world is fading away, we can know that the entire cosmos will be made new because Christ has been raised far above all things and that same power is at work in us, in the church. And the third place, which links on from that, that this power is at work is in the world, in the world. Let me explain what I mean by that. You notice verses 22 and 23 again, Paul says, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who feels everything in every way. So Christ is given as head over all things, all realms, all powers, all authorities to the church so that by his power in and through the church, he might make the world new. The church in Christ has certain victory. It becomes a new humanity. It becomes the start of the new creation. The church is promised ultimate victory in the world because of Christ's victory. The victory of Christ is the victory of the church because through faith we're one with him. Notice how Paul says that he is the head, we are the body, we are one with him, with our life and growth coming from him and his power. And ultimately that means that one with Christ, we are this new humanity, one with him. We died with him, we're raised with him to new life and that new life will be a new life which is known by us in all its fullness in the new creation when the world is 
remade. Well, we're out of time now, um, but I pray that that will be a blessing to us. Um, let's sing that song that I quoted um, earlier. Um, I cannot tell. I cannot tell. Let's sing together now. Set his love upon the sons of men. Oh, why I shed, but he should seek the wanderers to bring them back. They know not how or where, but this I know.
And now, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Amen.